now we can move to our next presentation. Next one is a joint presentation is given by two of our um, RAs at the MASA project, um, Jack Tumani and, and Afifa Khan. And they're going to talk about a more technical sides of what we do and about the uh, uh, basics of georeferencing and how at MASA we do, uh, we develop a methodology for the georeferencing geo of these historical maps. Um, Jack, to you, if you can unmute yourself and then share your screen. Hey, can you see my screen? Yes, yes, yes. thanks, Jack. Brilliant. Uh, thanks, Azade, and hello, everyone. Um, so, as Azade said, my name's Jack Tomney, and I'm a research assistant on the MASA project. And together with, uh, uh, if you can't, sorry, there we go. Uh, we're going to be talking about the uh, next steps after digitizing the paper map, which is uh, georeferencing. And more specifically, we're going to talk about our methodology for the systematic georeferencing of maps. Uh, so it's great to see so many people on the call, um, but I know that the audience has a wide range of experience using geographic data. So to put our methodology into context and for it to make sense, I will first be going through the basics of georeferencing explaining what it is, uh, what it's used for, kind of technically, how it works, and some of the key terminology uh, to do with that. Um, then I will pass over to Afifa, who will uh, take over and talk more specifically about how we are referencing the Survey of India maps in the MASA project, uh, and how we are manually identifying archaeological features from these maps, and then the next steps after this in the process. So it's, it's been said a few times in the presentation, um, but, but first I'll explain what actually is georeferencing before talking more in depth about this. So a succinct definition of georeferencing is the process of assigning locations to geographical objects within a certain frame of reference. And I've taken that from a paper by Hacker, Hacker Lower et al in 2014. Um, and I like it because it's, it's a very um, short definition of this. And, but in other words, it means that georeferencing is the process of taking digital images, such as paper maps or remotely sensed data taken from planes or satellites, or really any image that has a geographical aspect to it, and associating it within a reference system so that a user can determine where every point and therefore every geographical object on that image is actually located on Earth. Um, so. Now I've defined georeferencing, I thought I'd just show a few interesting uh, maps that have been georeferenced, not from this project, just, just some nice ones just to get an idea of, of what it is. So this is a, um, an 1892 from, map from Antwerp um, in Belgium. And as you can see, it's a, quite a detailed map. It has some nice pictorial um, pictures of buildings. So after it's georeferenced, we can see that the map then lines up against where it actually is on the earth on a on Google Maps behind it, so we can now see exactly where these buildings are. Um, this can also be done over a larger scale. Um, and this is a 1919 map of Madeira that I've made a GIF on. So you can see that it's been georeferenced to the, the uh, Google um, Maps behind it. Um, and it comes on and goes off. And you can see that the map has loads of really interesting topographical features. Um, and once georeferenced, you can find where these topographical features that are shown in this 1919 map are actually on the earth. And finally, you can georeference for even larger areas. So this is um, a composite map of South America from 1718, which um, I really like. And it's been um, georeferenced over the, a Google satellite image of um, South America. So I think it's really interesting. There's lots of areas missing from the map that the cartographer didn't know what was there. Um, but, and you can see it's been bent out of shape to, to fit its actual location. So I'm now going to talk about the technical aspects of how to georeference an image and some of the terminology that's important to know and to understand when designing a methodology for doing this. Um, because in some cases, although it may look like it, it's not as simple as just placing the map on top of the satellite image. There's actually quite a lot of technical work that, that goes on. So amongst others, there are four main steps that need to be done and decisions that need to be made during uh, georeferencing. Uh, and I'll expand on each of these in the following 
sections. Um, so first is about reference systems. So the images that we want to georeference, such as the paper maps, um, have historically been created and drawn in many, many different coordinate reference systems and to many different accuracies. And these need to be georeferenced into a known coordinate reference system so that they can be viewed accurately on a computer. As when the historic maps are initially digitized, as, as Janaid talked about, they will only be associated to the computer uh, with the digital images internal reference system rather than the coordinate reference system that they were drawn in. Um, so to do this, the digital image will need to be transformed from their internal image reference system to a coordinate reference system. And this means that they will need to be stretched, scaled, bent, curved in specific ways. Um, and so often they will also need to be resampled so that the locations on the image actually fit their locations on the earth. So we need to decide on how much we want the image to be transformed and how we want it to be resampled. And in order for the computer, for the GIS to know how to transform the image, ground control points need to be selected by a user. So all of the process uh, that I talked about is commonly done in a GIS, such as ArcGIS, uh, QGIS, NV. Um, I, there are some kind of online uh, GISs that can also be done. Um, I know that there's you know, crowdsourced georeferencing of images that can be done on specific uh, online GISs as well. Um, Okay, so, so first um, I'm going to talk about reference systems in a bit more detail. So when I, I um, talk about reference systems and georeferencing, I am referring to two different reference systems. And this is first the internal reference system of the digital image that has been scanned. And second it is the coordinate reference system, uh, which is what a historic map we had originally been drawn into, but also what we want to project the digital image so it's going to a bit more information about these two reference systems. First, uh, the image reference system. So as we know from Janaid's uh, presentation, uh, digital images, when they're scanned in, they're made up of pixels. And the higher the resolution, the more pixels there are that, that show that image. So the digital Im images are often made up of millions and millions of pixels. This image on the right hand side represents how a digital image looks when it's very, very zoomed in. So, very, very, very zoomed in. Um, so, uh, so that each individual pixel uh, that makes up this image, which is the coloured squares, can be seen. Uh, the pixels have numeric data associated with them, which can refer to a characteristic. And in the case of historic maps, the data in the pixel refers to the colour that that pixel makes up. Uh, on the picture of the historic map. So when we open these images and data sets, uh, such as these inner GIS, we refer to them as raster data sets. And a raster data set can hold four locational characteristics in order to place the image within a GIS. And this is, it can hold a coordinate system. It can hold uh, a reference coordinate. So this is almost like the starting coordinate of the image, which is often in the, the top left of the raster. It will hold the cell size, so the pixel size of the image, and a count of rows and columns. So these properties help the image to be correctly located. However, when first opened in a GIS, the digitized image, raster, won't have any of these properties related to any location on Earth. Instead, it will have an internal image reference system, which is based on the rows and columns of the pixels. Uh, for example, um, if I can draw on this, the, the top pixel in top left hand corner will have usually be pixel zero zero as um as the refer image reference systems will start in zero. Uh, the one beneath it will be uh, one zero and the one to the right will be zero one. Turn off. Okay, so in a similar way to uh, how the image knows what pixels are where based on this uh, numeric uh, system, we also have reference systems on Earth, so we can pinpoint locations using a system of numbers. And these are called coordinate reference systems. Uh, so there are many different coordinate reference systems, and 
To explain why, very briefly, the shape of the Earth is actually uh, is a geoid. Um, so without going into too much detail, a geoid is like an ellipsoid, but it's not so smooth. So some bits are bumpier than other bits. This is the image is obviously an uh, exaggerated representation of that. So it's obviously too complex to, um, for a geoid to be used as a reference for measurement. So, so what is done to make a consistent map is a reference ellipsoid is used uh, as an approximation of the surface of the Earth. And this uh, image shows that. So the red perfect circle is the reference ellipsoid. And uh, underneath it, the, um, the black kind of bumpy image is the, the geoid of the, the Earth. So this approximates the, the locations on the Earth. So once we have this reference ellipsoid, we then have a 3D shape for which to draw longitude and latitude lines, which create a coordinate reference system. So this, this coordinate reference system works in the same way as the image reference system in the fact that each location on the surface of Earth, just as the pixels in the image, have a set, a set number, a set of numbers, which can be used as a reference point. Uh, so the reason there's many coordinate reference system is the fact that the uh, reference ellipsoid doesn't fit perfectly, as you can see from the middle image on everywhere on Earth. So there are many ellipsoids with some perfectly fitting some locations and some perfectly fitting others. So some are better for local measurements, some are better for global measurements. Um, so in uh, this three dimensional coordinate system is called a geographic coordinate system. However, most maps are viewed in 2D. Um, especially historically, and we need to flatten, so we need to flatten that geographic coordinate system into two dimensions. So when we do that, this is called a projected coordinate system. Obviously, projecting a 3D image onto a 2D surface doesn't always work perfectly. Um, for example, if you were to take the skin off an orange and try and flatten it, some parts of that skin would be bent in different ways. It wouldn't be evenly flattened. So there are therefore many different ways of mathematically projecting this geographic coordinate system into a projected coordinate system. Um, an example of two different ways of projecting the same geographic coordinate system is shown here uh, with the image on the right um, giving the, the same amount of area to each uh, line of latitude which elongates the poles whereas the image on the left is uh, a projection that preserves the actual relative areas of the Earth. So the poles are a lot smaller. Um, yeah. Uh, so when georeferencing, it's likely that the historic map will be drawn into a coordinate reference system. Therefore, we need to choose a sensible coordinate reference system to digitize this image into, which is preferably the same one that the historic map has been drawn into. And we do that so the map isn't completely distorted and so that if we're doing a series of maps, which we are, the map series can consistently fit on the map. Um, it's important to choose a series based on the purpose of the map and the project. And just to give an example, there's almost 3,000 different coordinate reference systems in QGIS, so a lot to choose from. So in essence, what we're doing in georeferencing is we're translating the image's internal reference system into a coordinate reference system. As shown in this rudimentary diagram, you can see on the left, uh, the input units are pixels, which is the image. And once georeferenced, you can see that the image is now in map units. So that would be measured in degrees, meters, or whatever the um, coordinate reference system you're using is measured in. Um, in actuality, it doesn't happen exactly like this, and I will explain a bit later, and that's because images have to be transformed to fit the coordinate reference system. But this is a useful interpretation of how to understand what georeferencing is doing. So once we know what coordinate reference system we want to project the raster into, we have to tell the computer where the raster image should be within this coordinate reference system. And to do this, ground control points have to be selected by the user. So ground control points are locations that are visible on both the historic raster image, but also on the image that has already, an image that has already been georeferenced to the chosen coordinate system. So this could be a satellite image or Google Maps. Um, so what can be used as a ground control point? 
pretty pretty much anything that is uh, visible on both the historic map and uh, on a georeferenced image that hasn't moved that we can identify can be used as a ground control point. Afifa will go through a bit later what we've been using in the Survey of India maps, but just in his example, his um his two points from uh, uh, a map, um, I think it's in Amsterdam, where you can see that there is a, a junction on the road in the red on the left, and you can still see that junction on today's map in the image on the right. And the purple image shows uh, the junction in a canal in the historic map that you can still see in the map on the right. So what you do is you select these ground control points on both of the, the maps, and when they are selected, a control point pair is made. And this defines a relationship between the coordinates of the internal reference system and the coordinate reference system of where those pixels actually are on Earth. So general rule is that the more ground control points that are selected and the more spread out they are throughout the historic map, then the more accurate the georeferencing will be. OK, so now we know which coordinate reference system we want our map to be in. Uh, and what ground control points are and where we're going to place them and how many we need. So now we need to decide on how much we're going to allow the historic map to be transformed to fit the coordinate reference system. So this is what a transformation type is. And it's essentially an algorithm that takes the locational data of the ground control points and translates the entire digitized image from its internal reference system to the coordinate reference system. There are two types of transformation types, but I'm just going to go through uh, one. So there's global and local, and I'll just go through global. Um, and the most common of the global transformation uh, algorithms is the polynomial transformations, which you can see in the image on the left of the screen there. Um, so these are least squared algorithms that create one formula based on all the ground control points to apply to the digital image. So as it uses all the ground control points, it may mean that there is a slight shift to where the ground control points end up from where they have been designated to, but this is so that the map is transformed to best fit all of the ground control points and not distort the image specifically towards any single point. So as you can see from the diagram, the higher the, higher the polynomial order is, the more movement that is allowed by the algorithm. So the first order polynomial will allow the image to be shifted, scaled and rotated, but it can't be bent or curved. The second order polynomial allows some bending and curving of the digital image, whereas the third polynomial allows even more bending and curving. So you can see it actually looks quite wavy on this, um, on this diagram. So it's really important to pick the best transformation type for the image, as too much movement can lead to the image being distorted towards specific GCPs, where too little, uh, too little movement may end up with the image being too rigid and not fitting the correct locations. Um, so finally, the last setting, the last um, technical detail that we need to be considered is which resampling method to use. So after the transformation is applied to the input raster image, uh, we know it's often bent, squashed and distorted as I just showed. However, in a GIS and within a specific coordinate reference system, raster cells, or as I showed before, pixels, need to be the same size as each other and square. Um, but due to the transformation, the pixels of the input image are often not even sizes and they're not square. So what happens is, and this sounds a bit complicated to explain, but I'll show a diagram in a section in, in a second. Um, so what happens is a new empty matrix of cells that look like the pixel image I showed you earlier is created based on the coordinate reference system transformation and on the map coordinates given by the ground control points. And then values are then assigned into each of these cells of this new matrix from the original transformed image. So this is resampling and there's several techniques used to assign the value from the transformed image into the new empty cells. To explain that a bit better, uh, here's a picture of uh, the transformed historic image after we have applied the transformation to it. Uh, so as you can see, there's nine pixels here. So these are the squares. 
which have been warped and bent, and the points indicate the center of these pixels. So what's happened is for the georeferenced map to be correctly made, the GIS puts a new grid of cells over that location of, of where the, the transformed image has been, uh, indicated by these red squares. So you can see that the cells are now even and they are square, but they don't match up with the original pixels. Um, the red cross is, by the way, is the center point of the new, um, the new grid of cells. So, uh, so the resampling uh, is used to assign values <clears throat> from the image, from the original image to the new cells. So here, for example, this is the nearest neighbor uh, method where the value of the center of the input pixels closest to that of the new output cells is used as a value for the output cell. So this preserves the value of the cell, uh, which in the case of ours, would, it would be preserving the color of the historic map. But it does mean that sometimes two cells next to each other will have the same value. Um, so for example, if I just put the pen on, we can see that this cell here and this cell here have both taken the uh, value from this original cell here because they are both closest to it. So these will both end up being the same color. Uh, we have a couple of, uh, where is that? Uh, the other um, resampling technique I'll explain is the cubic method, which does the same thing, but what it does is it takes the value from the four closest input cells to the output cell and takes a weighted average of this. So this makes the image look smoother once it's been georeferenced, but it actually doesn't um, keep the original colors of the image. So for a historic map, that is something that we wouldn't want to do. So a real life example of this from um, some of our historic our georeference maps is, uh, and this is the nearest neighbor method. This is a very, very zoomed in portion of an ungeoreference map on the left and the, a georeference map on the right. So if you look closely at the A in this image, you can see that there is a row of three pixels, which I highlight here, that are slightly lighter than the rest. So one, two, three. So um, before that, before the georeferencing, there is only um, one row of these, but after georeferencing, they look like they have widened slightly. But what actually happened is there's now two rows of pixels. And um, and due to the transformation and the resampling method um, and re resampling technique that has been used, uh, the uh, two rows have taken the same color from the original one row. So, so I've gone through some of the key technical aspects and terminology of georeferencing, uh, and therefore the steps that need to be taken when designing a methodology for georeferencing and also how different technical decisions can affect the output of the georeference map. Um, so here are some of the questions that we asked ourselves when deciding how to georeference our maps and what our methodology would be. So first, what coordinate reference system we want the map georeference to? Do we want global or do we want local accuracy? Ground control points, what points are present on our maps that can be georeferenced? How many ground points, control points do we think is enough? Transformation type, how, how much movement do we want to allow the image to have? What type of transformation is appropriate for our maps? And finally, uh, resampling. Will the image need to be resampled? Almost definitely. And if so, what is the best way to do this? Do we want to keep the true value, uh, the true color of the pixels? So now I've gone through some of these uh, technical details, I'll pass over to Afifa, who will talk specifically about georeferencing in the MASA project. Uh, why we are doing this and what our methodology is for this. I'll stop sharing my screen. And over to you, Afifa. Sorry, I forgot to unmute myself again. Is that showing now? Yes, thanks, Afisa. 
Okay, thank you. Hello, I'm Matthew Pakan. I'm the one of the other um, research assistants at MASA, and I'll be talking about um, basically what Jack has been talking about and how we use it uh, in our project, and also the kind of features that we're interested on the maps and the outcomes we hope to get from them. So there'll be a little, little bit of repetition maybe with uh, some of uh, Cameron's presentation, but if you missed it or if you liked it as much as I did, then this is your chance to get it again. Um, so we are going to be uh, georeferencing survey of India maps from the early 19th century to um, from the late 19th century to the early 20th century, but focusing um, initially on kind of the post 1906 period to um, before the 1940 period, because we found that that series of maps were more standardized, were a bit more accurate, and so can provide a better comparison and also um, have also been um, accurately uh, surveyed to a certain level as well. Many of the maps that we've got and we've sourced from libraries such as um, the British Library and Cambridge University Library, but these are all repositories from the UK uh, specifically. We know there are some repositories outside of the UK and hopefully we'll be tracking those down in due time as well. And as Cameron went over, um, these maps also, we were using them because they covered an area before rapid urbanization and agricultural activity took over South Asia. And so they got a point where you could find these very interesting features before maybe they were covered with uh, farmlands or before they might have been destroyed through other processes. Um, so not only do these allow us to track changes in archaeology and in the environment in South Asia, but they, they can also uh, provide ways of detecting potential archaeology that we have not uh, yet maybe ground truth or found or maybe uh, archaeology that has been found previously but needs to be refound now. Um, these maps were quite were of quite high quality and precisely made but the, geo the um, coordinate reference system is a little bit outdated so we need to uh, adjust our methods a little bit. So you can see here this is um, a bit of land in Punjab that's shared by both Pakistan and India. And this is the uh, Google satellite Im image, and this is the Survey of India map. And what we hope to get is this image by the end. So we want to go from this to this to this. And as you can see, the, the shape of the Survey of India map changes a little bit once it's been georeferenced, and I'll go over why that happens. Over here, you can also see that once we've georeferenced the map, it matches the satellite uh, image very nicely. And one way you can tell this is this main road here, which follows all the way through. But this is also uh, very useful for us because we can zoom in and out between the layers and see how the features on the maps kind of overlay and have changed uh, between the map and the uh, Google satellite image. So these are the settings that uh, Jack was talking about and the settings we use specifically. Um, I won't go step by step um, in what we do to georeference. Um, we use QGIS. Uh, so that means we go to the top tab and go to the raster and um, go to the georeferencer tab. What's more important is that uh, you understand why we use uh, these settings. So for the transformation type, you can see here is pol polynomial two because it allows for some amount of bending and shifting without distorting the map completely. And that way we can uh, preserve some of the distances between the map and the Google satellite image. We use the resampling method nearest, ne nearest neighbor to preserve the colors of the map, which is important because um, different colored uh, features, so roads, and canals, they can tell us different things. The targets uh, SRS or CRS uh, is WGS84, which is a 
a very global standard of coordinate reference systems so that helps us um, reference these map maps over a large area such as uh, South, South Asia. You can sometimes get very regional and uh, specific um, CRSs in uh, covering South Asia, but that would mean that you'd have to use multiple. So we found it more useful to use uh, WGS84. Now, commonly, a lot of people when uh, georeferencing historic maps will use the corners of the maps. Um, you can see over here that the coordinates are in uh, degrees minutes and we'd have to convert them into uh, decimal degrees over here. But there are a few issues with doing this for our maps. Here, you get the corners. Um, it's a quick way of doing it. However, because the maps are uh, have aged over time and worn over time, uh, the creases and folds can cause a bit of a warping. So if you take the uh, example of the orange that Jack talked about, if you were to place a smooth piece of paper over that orange, it would match quite nicely. However, if you were to crumple it and then put it over the, over the orange, which is our globe, you'll find that some of the distances have changed and you can't really accurately georeference from that. Um, the, uh, another problem with uh, georeferencing from the corners is that the coordinate reference system used by the Survey of India at that point is now uh, outdated and so we have to um, use an updated way of uh, georeferencing because of, to, um, to kind of make up for that. So we have decided to uh, georeference using the features instead. So these are features that match within the maps, but also within the Google satellite imagery. So this can be uh, major infrastructure, so uh, canals and roads and where they intersect. You can see over here that uh, two roads have intersected and this is a bridge over canal. So a lot of these major uh, pieces of in infrastructure match within the maps and within the Google satellite imagery as well. And another example here is of a railroad and a, and a main road, uh, a rail, sorry, a railway and a main road crossing together. However, in some areas such as rural areas and deserts, you don't always get um, a lot of this ma uh, main infrastructure or it might have shifted uh, majorly, or sometimes you'll have places where the river has shifted and completely changed the landscape. So we have to be a little bit creative with the kinds of features we've used. In some cases, that means using grave sites, such as, such as this feature here, or using uh, forts or uh, maybe religious buildings and things like that. This doesn't create the most accurate georeferencing, but in some cases, it, it's or we can really go by it. And in any case, in a lot of these places, you might not get the kind of archeological features that we're interested in looking at anyway. And that's especially true for places like the mountainous regions where maybe you'll get some forts, but by and large, the kind of features that we want to be detecting aren't really in those regions. And in, um, in cases like mountainous regions, you can sometimes use uh, topographical features. So places where certain uh, mountains join up, you can um, use GCP, GCP points. And also uh, you'll find that wells are the same in the historic maps and in the current Google satellite imagery as well. So those can provide some interesting places for GCPs. And a basic rule for georeferencing is that the more GCPs you can place um, and the more evenly they're spread uh, throughout the map, the more accurate the georeferencing will be. So as you can see here, you've tri we've tried not to have too many GCPs in any one square or in one any one area. This is just uh, an image to show the kind of progress we've made already with georeferencing. So the purple uh, squares 
are the maps that we've georeferenced with the master project and the um, orange ones are the ones that have been done pre in, through previous projects. The yellow ones are the ones that we hope to do uh, quite uh, soon into the future. And this is just to show that once it's um, a map series has been georeferenced, this area is uh, Punjab, so you can see Lahore here and uh, Amritsar here. You can see that these maps uh, line up really nicely together. You have to ignore the, the borders and imagine the maps as uh, this kind of detailed area here. And as you can see, you see this uh, main road running through the, the maps here. It shows that it's been uh, geo-referenced to a, a high degree. So there are lots of features on the maps and some of them uh, Cameron's mentioned already. And um, you can see there's things like temples and shrines, and these don't always tell you uh, what religion they belong to. So they could be Hindu, they could be Sikh Gurdwaras. Um, the only ones that are dif differentiated are the mosques, which are uh, commonly this, simple, this symbol here. Grave sites can be um, uh, kind of indicated with two kinds of uh, symbols. You have this symbol here, which Sometimes um, you get in some of the, the later maps, more, more commonly you'll get these mound symbols. You also have uh, the fort symbol, which you can find throughout um, the region, but also uh, the kinds of features that are of interest to us are things like wells and ponds. Uh, so these are the wells and these are the ponds, and um, sometimes they can be confused with mounds if they're dried up ponds, because then you just get these lines, these solid lines here, but in any case they're of interest to us as well. So this is, this is the example of the fort at Kot Diji, so you can see that this, even though this is a, a very squared symbol, it doesn't always reflect the, uh, the shape and the size of the uh, fort on the ground. However, we will be more um, concerned with these mounds that uh, Cameron had talked about, and I won't talk about it in too much detail, but as he said, sometimes you do find that these mounds aren't always archaeological features, and you normally find that with these shaded and stippled mounds here, um, which sometimes can be river embankments or sand dunes, and the more um, kind of archaeologically interesting mounds can sometimes be these discontinuous form, la form line mounds or the hashed mounds here, which you can see have uh, the crosses indicating um, an abandoned settlement or sometimes a, a temple here. I'm sorry, I forgot to cut you. I just told you that you have two minutes. If that's okay. It's okay. <laughs> I can, okay, I can thanks, speak with this. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so this is the example of Rafi Gari. I liked it so much I used it in my uh, slideshow as well, but you can also see that's the, the modern satellite image and it overlaps quite nicely. You can see the, the uh, archaeological sites here and then you have the, the modern town over here. So after the uh, sites have been identified, and this is mainly the mounds I'm talking about, we've uh, created polygons over the mounds. And then this data will be sent to uh, our collaborators, uh, Hector and Iban, who will be putting it through machine learning processes so that we don't have to um, manually identify all of these uh, all of these sites, we hope to maybe rapidly speed up the process. But Eben will hopefully be talking about that later anyway, so I won't go, go into it in a, in a great amount of detail. But these maps are more than just mounds, and there's a lot of information on them that we're interested in. So in the margins, you'll find all kinds of interesting metadata that we'll be, we will also be collecting. That includes the survey dates, um, which will tell you if uh, a map has been recreated using an older map, or whether it's been completely resurveyed. So in the um, in the case study of Dera Ghazi Khan, they, show, they showed um, significant landscape change because of the, of the flooding. 
Other things uh, that we're interested, interested in are the Surveyor General, because then you can track which maps have been uh, created by uh, underneath the same person or with, uh, with potentially the same team. Um, also, the legends will tell you uh, the kinds of different uh, features to look out uh, on the map and also the different kinds of terrain. So this is just to show you, uh, this is the region that the, uh, the districts that the map will be covering. The indexes will show you uh, what the adjoining maps are. And this is the uh, coordinates of the map in degrees minutes, the, the legend, the uh, name of the Surveyor General, and also the date that the map was published, not to be uh, uh, you know, mixed up with the survey dates, which are normally found on the top of the map. So we hope to, at the end of this process, get a, as complete a series of one inch, one mile ma maps covering our project area, which is uh, Pakistan and Northern India for now. Um, and hopefully potentially with multiple additions to kind of track that landscape change. Uh, we hope to georeference these maps to a higher degree of accuracy so that we can accurately uh, detect the archaeological features on the ground and also create uh, metadata from these maps based on the information I've just shown, the uh, publication dates, the, lo uh, the locations, the Surveyor General, etc. And then we also, uh, more importantly, want to locate the mounds and potential ar archaeological sites and also the heritage sites uh, using the remote sensing and machine, machine learning methods. So uh, if you want to follow our work, you can uh, go to our website or uh, our Instagram site or, our, um, or follow us on Twitter as well. Thank you. Many thanks, Atifa, and thank you both to you and uh, um, Jack for this wonderful presentation and overview of georeferencing of these maps in general, but uh, methodology that the master project is using in how, on how to georeference survey of India um, maps. Um, I don't see any questions yet in the chat box. If you have any questions, do you have any question about this, uh, about the referencing of maps and also the specific mass on methodology, um, I might ask you just to raise your hand and ask your question um, just to give us enough time after two hours to have a 10 minutes break to move and have a coffee. But if you have any questions, please raise your hand um, to Afifa and Jack. Uh, 